Hello. Uh, well, pleasure to be here. Thanks, Andrea, David. So, uh, what I would like to discuss today is um, a fairly unusual kind of um, interactions which can be realized in optics. And they are much longer range than what the previous speaker was talking about. I will make the connection with that. Uh, and uh, uh, it has other merits, uh, except for uh, the length of the range. Uh, there is a very rich variety of physics which can be uh, associated with it. So, uh, oops, what did I do wrong? Yeah, uh, yeah, this. Uh, what I'll be talking about is mostly the PhD thesis of uh, Effie Ephraim Shachmoun uh, at the Weizmann Institute. He's now at Harvard, still continuing this kind of work. And then uh, another collaborator of ours uh, is Igor Mazetz, a former postdoc and now a scientist in Vienna. Now, what uh, I would like to uh, do is first present the outline which consists of three parts. The first has to do with uh, the unusual long-range vacuum forces, um, which we can encounter in uh, waveguides, in transmission lines, as I will explain. Then uh, I will move on to uh, long-range dipolar interactions which we find are extremely advantageous in fiber gratings. And there they allow to transfer entanglement in a deterministic uh, fashion without losses or dissipation over very long distances. And finally, and this is uh, viewed as a highlight, uh, I will discuss the possibility of realizing highly known local nonlinear optics, proper nonlinear optics, nonlinear uh, uh, Schrodinger uh, equation by a combination of uh, electromagnetically induced transparency and uh, laser induced dipolar forces. Okay. Now, let's move on to um, uh, vacuum forces. Everyone knows that vacuum forces in the quasi-static limit scale as 1 over r to the 6th. And when they are uh, retarded, they scale as 1 over r to the 7th. Uh, but the question is, what determines this uh, uh, scaling dependence? Um, and the usual answer is that it is the geometry of the objects. Okay. So for example, if you have two planes, uh, their um, um, van der Waals interaction uh, scales as 1 over a dq. Uh, however, there can be another approach, and that is to consider what is the essential mechanism of these vacuum forces, and that is the exchange of uh, virtual photons via, uh, or if you like, vacuum fluctuations. And uh, therefore, uh, to affect their, the space dependence of these interactions by uh, shaping the geometry of the environment in which the objects are placed. So it's not the uh, geometry of the objects that we're looking at. It is the environment in which they are placed. And in particular, we find that you get very unusual properties when you enclose polarizable objects in a one-dimensional environment, in a waveguide, okay? Uh, there you can get giant Van der Waals and Casimir forces. So uh, the uh, quite amazing discovery which uh, uh, Effie uh, made was that the, the very particular uh, uh, geometry that one should look at is uh, the coaxial cable, which everyone knows, everyone has at home, okay? Uh, there is the open version of a coaxial cable that's a coplanar waveguide, but it's the same thing. You see this thin stripe? 
uh, in between two large uh, uh, metal plates, it's the same. So the w w claim is that if you place two polarizable objects within such a waveguide, and only such a waveguide, uh, you get a huge enhancement of uh, the vacuum forces, okay? Why is that? That's because they have uh, an amazing mode, okay? That's their fundamental mode. It's the TEM mode. No other structure uh, has this mode. It's a mode which is diffractionless, okay? It has the same dispersion as uh, a plane wave in vacuum. It's normalized by a constant uh, factor, and otherwise it just propagates as e to the i k z, okay? Nothing else. And you see this is the dispersion, free space dispersion, okay? Uh, if you look at different kinds of uh, waveguides, because they have a cutoff frequency, okay, you won't get this kind of dispersionless uh, propagation, and therefore you will have inevitably diffraction effects. And diffraction effects are the killer for the enhancement or the long range of vacuum forces. Okay, it's far from being obvious. Uh, okay, so this is the key property: TEM mode, free space in one dimension. Uh, now. You can evaluate uh, vacuum forces between two polarizable objects in such a waveguide by a diagrammatic technique. Okay, it's fourth order perturbation theory. Uh, if it did that, it's cumbersome but doable, but you don't get much insight from it. But there is an alternative approach due to Miloni uh, where you uh, actually uh, pretend as if you have real dipoles and real propagating fields, although these are all vacuum fluctuations. So you say there is a, a vacuum field which induces a dipole, okay, number one. Then this becomes a source for further propagation of a vacuum field to dipole two, which in turn is induced by these vacuum fluctuations and affects back uh, dipole one, okay? Uh, and the, you do the calculation uh, just using Maxwell equations, nothing else, okay? Once you do that, you realize that what really determines the uh, um, distance dependence of these forces is the ability to propagate virtual photons between these objects without diffraction, okay? Uh, because then every virtual photon that um, emanates from one will end up in uh, at two and vice versa, okay? So it's extremely simple, but it has taken us some time to realize. <clears throat> now, okay, uh, so once you do that, and you get the same result from both approaches, so they check, uh, you can, in fact, analytically solve for the distance dependence uh, of uh, the vacuum force between uh, two such uh, polarizable objects. You take some characteristic transition frequency in these uh, uh, objects, but of course, it, it doesn't really matter uh, what transition you take because you have to sum eventually over all possible transitions. But there is one, say, that contributes more than others. And uh, what you find that really the crucial quantity is this uh, um, small distance which uh, determines the core thickness of the uh, coaxial cable or uh, transition uh, um, or waveguide. All right, so it's this A. Uh, once you have A and lambda is characteristic wavelengths, you can uh, uh, write the interaction energy between two dipoles uh, within this uh, uh, environment as a function of uh, Z uh, normalized by this wavelength, and lo and behold, you obtain completely different uh, 
uh, scale dependencies than you might expect. Uh, in the Van der Waals regime, for a z smaller than this characteristic wavelength, uh, it scales as a constant plus z log z, okay? As opposed to 1 over z to the 6 in free space. That's why I was saying, much longer range. Furthermore, if you go to the casimir polder retarded regime, you find a dependence on 1 over z cube instead of 1 to the uh, z uh, over uh, 1 over z to the 7. And when you evaluate the overall magnitude of this interaction, you find that in the Van der Waals regime, uh, at distances that are 1% of this characteristic wavelength, you have an enhancement of the order of 10 to the 7 compared to free space. Okay? In the Casimir Polder regime, the enhancement is even larger. You see, up to 10 to the 23rd. Uh, if you uh, have distances on the order of 50 wavelengths. However, the absolute magnitude of the effect becomes very small at such distances, and this is probably not detectable. But uh, this limit, we contend, is uh, something you can test um, in the lab. All right? So this is what we have. And uh, what we think is that, at present, the best uh, um, setup for testing this prediction is using two superconducting transmon qubits placed in such a superconducting waveguide because they have giant dipole moments. And this, of course, uh, uh, is what you're looking for. So if you take typical parameters, what you find is that at 1% of their characteristic wavelength, okay, which is this, you get um, a, an energy shift of 28 megahertz compared to what you would expect uh, for free space. And this shift is much larger than the line width of the transition. So this is clearly detectable. Okay. Uh, uh, actually, John Martinez even promised us to do the experiment before he was drawn by quantum computing, and we never heard from him before. But uh, it's definitely doable. Uh, the casimir polder regime is uh, much more challenging because uh, the shift is then smaller than the line width. So unless we are able technologically to come up with transmons that have much smaller line widths, this probably is going to be hard, not impossible, but hard to measure. OK, so much for um, uh, transmission uh, of vacuum forces over large distances. Now, let's turn to uh, the interaction of dipoles via what we call resonant dipole-dipole interactions. We've been interested in that for a long time because uh, we always felt that this should be a good mechanism for entangling uh, atoms or dipoles over large distances. But there is a problem there. And the problem is the following, that uh, when you uh, have uh, a resonant dipole-dipole interaction, that means that Two atoms share an excitation. One atom, say, is excited, the other is not. Uh, there is always uh, the exchange of a real photon to worry about, because the exchange of a real photon is a dissipative process. Okay? Uh, you exchange a spontaneously uh, emitted photon, which is then absorbed and re-emitted by uh, the partner. This kind of process is indeterministic dissipative, diffusive, what have you, and uh, this is not what you want. This uh, uh, occurs at the resonant uh, frequency of the atoms. But then, uh, and uh, okay, so let's look at how uh, this force scales. Uh, at long ranges, in 3D, it scales as sine kr over kr. Uh, but 
in 1D, it scales as cosine kz, okay, if you are able to confine uh, your field to 1D only. Uh, by contrast, uh, there is the dispersive or coherent part of the interaction, which is mediated by virtual photons. They are virtual in the sense that they are off-resonant with the atoms. Uh, nevertheless, they contribute to the energy shift uh, of the atoms, okay? So all frequencies that are off-resonant uh, with the atoms will contribute to that. They are associated with the real part of the self-energy as opposed to the dissipative part, which is associated with the imaginary part of the uh, self-energy. And in 1D, uh, they scale as uh, sine kz. Now, uh, unfortunately, both in 3D and in 1D, it turns out that you cannot really get rid of the dissipative part of the exchange of uh, uh, spontaneously emitted uh, photons. Uh, with Duncan O'Dell, uh, who was an excellent postdoc some time ago, we uh, did um, a very interesting work concerning long-range interactions in dipolar gases, uh, which were mediated by these cosine kr over kr uh, terms. Uh, however, uh, what was the killer uh, then was this sine kr over kr uh, uh, spontaneous emission uh, term, okay? There is no way uh, to ignore it because it scales in the same way. And even if you switch to 1D, you still face the same problem because uh, whereas the uh, uh, coherent part, which is the proper resonant dipole-dipole interaction, scales as sine kz, the uh, uh, spontaneous emission part scales as cosine kz, and there is no way to have one without the other. Okay. So it looks as a no-go theorem for a long time. But then uh, we found a solution, again, thanks to Effie's work. And the solution was to uh, have not just 1D, but uh, a grating, which is uh, embedded in such a fiber. Okay. Uh, now, what difference does a grating make? The difference is that now you have a band gap in the dispersion, okay? And this will turn out to be crucial. Uh, what you then want to do is have atoms whose frequencies are within this band gap created by the grating. Uh, if this is true, then you block spontaneous emission uh, along the fiber, okay? where the uh, grating is placed, okay? That's the uh, effect of uh, the band gap, yes? Uh, frequencies which are within the band gap are forbidden uh, uh, along the fiber. And uh, uh, this um, uh, still leaves us with the spontaneous emission of photons sideways, okay? Uh, into uh, transverse modes outside the fiber. So let us say that the strength of emission or the rate of emission into such modes is gamma free. It's the same as what you have in um, uh, free space. Um, you obviously need um, the um, interaction, the dipole-dipole interaction that you are interested in. You need it to be much stronger than this gamma free. And this is what the band gap does for you. Because when you are very close to the band edge, okay, you have this huge upsurge in the mode density, which physically means that uh, a photon which is um, uh, approaching such, uh, uh, the, such a, an edge will be slowed down at the uh, vicinity of this bandage, okay? So it will spend a long time interacting with the atom and effectively enhance uh, the uh, interaction. By a factor which is one over the square root of uh, the uh, 
frequency uh, minus the band edge frequency. So as you approach, it becomes huge. Now, this is the enhancement factor compared to free, uh, free space spontaneous emission. It's this eta. But it is also the enhancement factor for the length scale of the interaction. Because as you see, within the band gap, uh, the interaction uh, decays exponentially with an exponent psi that is again uh, inversely proportional to the frequency distance between the uh, atomic resonance and the bed edge and the band edge. So uh, as a result, you are able very close to uh, uh, a band edge to ignore spontaneous emission both inside and outside the fiber and have pure dispersive long range effect which uh, extends as long as allowed by this uh, uh, exponential constant. Yes. Now, uh, first when we saw this, we thought this was a way of entangling uh, atoms because that's what such an interaction can do for you. They will exchange an interaction uh, in a non-dissipative coherent way, okay? And uh, since you can uh, presumably make this psi as large uh, as, um, large as you uh, uh, will, uh, you will be able to entangle atoms over enormous distances. But this is not the case. Uh, the reason is that uh, the treatment breaks down when you are extremely close to a bandage. Okay, then you have to resort to a much more sophisticated theory, which is a non-Markovian theory. It is then the case that the band edge actually binds the photon. All right, uh, this is an effect which we uh, discovered already in the 90s uh, for um, 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 the binding of a photon to an atom if the atom is placed within a band, a band gap very close to the band edge, okay? The photon then stays bound to the atom and uh, it does not propagate, okay? So you will have the same uh, uh, effect here with the result that if the atoms are very distant, they won't be able to exchange a photon. The photon will remain bound to the atom, okay? But still, you can have enhancement of the interaction by orders of magnitude, and we have checked that you can uh, entangle atoms with very high fidelity over distances of uh, 100 wavelengths or even more. Uh, so let me turn to uh, the final part, which concerns the possibility of having nonlinear optics, uh, which is mediated by uh, such long-range uh, interactions. Now, uh, here the starting point is the result by Flashauer and Lukin that uh, in a three-level atom with a very strong field operating between these two levels, uh, a probe field will first uh, not be absorbed by the uh, upper level because there will be destructive interference between this probe field and this coupling, yes. But furthermore, uh, there, I there is the possibility of mapping the um, excitation uh, uh, of uh, an atom, or conversely, mapping the field, this probe field, onto a an excitation uh, of this D state. So you can create uh, a super coherent superposition of G and D at will by tuning uh, the probe field and the, the strong coupling field uh, accordingly. Okay? So this is the first observation. Uh, then when uh, this uh, uh, entity propagates, you get sort of a spin wave uh, because uh, um, this excitation then will uh, wander from one atom to another, all right? 
and you will have these, uh, <coughs> these superpositions of G and D propagate um, uh, along the sample. But this is still, at this point, a local effect as far as the atom is concerned. And very early on, we have noted, and this was the work of Inbal Friedler. She was an excellent PhD student, and David Petrosian, who was also an amazing postdoc. Uh, we noted that there is the possibility of converting this effect into a long-range effect. For that, one would have to resort to Rydberg uh, atom interactions of the kind that we heard about, okay? So uh, the idea is that you first populate this D level by means of the probe field, and then this uh, D level uh, is uh, a Rydberg level with very uh, large polarizability. So if there is uh, a, a Rydberg uh, atom uh, somewhere uh, in the vicinity, uh, sufficiently close to it, there will be a dipolar interaction, dipole-dipole interaction between this Rydberg atom and uh, uh, another one, which again uh, has been prepared in the same way. And this will create cross-coupling between the probe fields that induce the excitations of the corresponding D levels in the two atoms. This is essentially the Kerr effect, but extended to uh, long ranges. Okay? So instead of having a delta function here, which is what you have in a Kerr effect, and these are the populations of uh, two adjacent uh, uh, D level uh, um, atoms, uh, you have here the dipole-dipole interaction, which is uh, uh, mediated by two Rydberg atoms, which scales as uh, one over R cube. Okay. Now, uh, this actually uh, gives rise to the most effective mechanism to date of entangling two photons. Photons usually uh, are extremely weakly interacting, of course. But in this way, they can interact because they first are converted into an atomic excitation. And this atomic excitation, in turn, interacts with, uh, the, with another uh, atom. And then you can convert it back to uh, a photon. So if you have two beams, okay, uh, each associated with uh, an ensemble of atoms of this kind, uh, there will be cross correlation between uh, these, uh, uh, these beams, these uh, fields. And we are pleased to say that uh, this uh, prediction of ours from 2005 was uh, realized in Lukin's group by Offer Fistenberg, who is now at Weizmann and is continuing this kind of work. So, uh, in fact, it has been proven that this is the most effective way of entangling photons because they interact over the longest distance possible. But we were still not completely happy because we are then limited by uh, the uh, interaction range of uh, um, dipole interacting uh, atoms. And the, uh, this is number one. Number two is that this is really uh, very effective as far as cross-phase modulation is concerned. Yes, you take two beams and you correlate them in phase. But what about self-phase modulation, which is really the heart of nonlinear optics, the analog of a nonlinear Schrodinger wave equation? Okay. And this is what we finally achieved, again, mainly thanks to EFI. Okay. So here is the setup we have in mind. Uh, it is a combination of all the elements uh, I've been talking about. Uh, it's a fiber in which you have um, a grating embedded, and the atoms populate this uh, grating. They may, but need not be Rydberg atoms. It works also for uh, regular uh, uh, atoms. 
there is this strong coupling field which uh, is needed to uh, induce this electromagnetically in induced transparency in the atoms, uh, and this is the weak probe field. So together, the weak probe field and this uh, omega uh, give rise to um, uh, electromagnetically induced transparency in the sample. But then in addition, you illuminate the sample uh, by this uh, laser, and as you see, it is slanted compare, uh, compared to the axis, and there is a good reason for that. So basically, uh, as far as the dipole-dipole interaction is concerned, uh, you have the dipole-dipole interaction which is mediated by this laser. The laser excites an, uh, uh, an atom of resonant, in fact, uh, because you want to avoid dissipation, so you tune it off resonant, but this laser is strong enough. Uh, and the length scale of the interaction, this dipolar interaction, is again uh, what we find in a fiber, which is essentially limited by this uh, exponent that diverges as you approach the bent edge of the grating. So it can be much, much longer range than your usual dipole-dipole interaction. But this is only one ingredient, okay? The other ingredient is that um, this D level, okay, uh, which was populated by means of this weak probe field and the strong coupling field, okay, has uh, a shift in frequency which is both uh, uh, long range as far as uh, the dipole-dipole uh, interaction is concerned, but it also is dispersive. And this is very tricky. Let me explain what I uh, mean by uh, this, okay? Uh, what I mean by this is that you have now to consider uh, what propagates in the sample in the presence of all these fields. So what propagates in the, the sample in the presence of this EIT, electromagnetically induced transparency, is a superposition of uh, the probe field and the excitation of the atom, okay, which is sort of a, a spin wave. It's a cooperative uh, uh, effect. Yes, there is this square root of n, which is the number of the atoms in the sample, which makes it large, because otherwise this theta is very small. It's inversely proportional to the intensity of the coupling. But this is the propagating entity. And this propagating entity uh, can obey uh, a, uh, a, uh, an equation which is completely analogous to the nonlinear Schrodinger uh, wave equation on one condition, okay? Uh, this part is just a nonlinear frequency shift, nonlinear because of the dipole-dipole interaction with the other atoms, but there is the dispersive part, okay, uh, which, uh, as you see here, is associated with the effective mass of the propagation. Now, the effective mass of the propagation is determined by the dispersion in the grating, okay? It is determined by the dispersion in the, uh, in the grating, yes? Whenever you have a grating and you have a bent edge, you have uh, a massive character of the propagation. But in order for it to be also proportional to the nonlinear uh, uh, frequency shift, which is induced by the dipole, dipole interaction, uh, you have to do something else. You have to detune uh, the, uh, the coupling field from resonance, which is usually not done. Okay? Uh, now, why do you have to detune it? Because when you look at the dispersion, which is seen by the probe field, the propagating probe field, uh, if this coupling field is on resonance, is resonant between E and D, uh, you have no dispersion at all, 
okay? You have this symmetric profile. This is the so-called transparency window. You see the absorption is zero here. Uh, the uh, width of this window is determined by the intensity of the coupling field. The larger the intensity, the larger the window. But the dispersion has zero at the probe frequency. But if you introduce a detuning, which is a combination of a linear and a nonlinear uh, frequency shift uh, of the coupling, uh, then the probe starts seeing a quadratic parabolic dispersion as a function of its frequency. And this is what you need in order to have a combination of massive propagation. This is the group velocity at the bend edge, which is determined by the rating, and this nonlinear uh, uh, frequency shift, which is determined by the dipolar interaction. So all in all, what we then find is a dispersion relation that is um, modified compared to the so-called free particle Bogolyubov dispersion relation that you find uh, when, uh, uh, when uh, uh, quasi-particles uh, propagate uh, in a grating. Uh, you find uh, mode frequencies okay, that deviate from uh, the, the mean uh, uh, frequency by this UK, which is the Fourier transform of the dipole-dipole interaction potential. Okay? And this leads to an amazing prediction, that there should be an optical rotom, which is analogous to the optical rotom that Duncan found for a dipolar gas. Here it is for photons. Okay. What is an optical rotom? It is a minimum of the dispersion at a certain uh, uh, wavelength, which corresponds to an attractive effect of this interaction. This, if this interaction is attractive, it lowers the uh, uh, dispersion or the energies. Am I? Uh, OK, five minutes. All right. So, uh, so uh, since the energy is lowered, there is a tendency of any fluctuation or any disturbance to bunch uh, around this uh, wave vector. And this wave vector uh, is, is the difference between the laser wave vector and the grating wave vector. Okay? So you can tune it. And uh, uh, here you can see that you get this uh, roton um, at, a, at a wavelength that corresponds to uh, one millimeter effectively. Okay? Now, uh, you as, uh, in the same way that you can have a roton, you can have an anti-roton. In other words, you can have, uh, a, instead of an attractive interaction, you can have a repulsive interaction that would tend to increase the uh, 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 dispersion compared to the uh, undisturbed dispersion, and it occurs at the same uh, wavelengths. Okay? So, uh, these are um, interesting features, but, and with this I will conclude. Uh, uh, the final feature that we are uh, looking at is dynamical or, uh, yeah, if you like, dynamical instability. You see, this dispersion relation can become imaginary. Okay? Uh, when the interaction is strong enough uh, and has a negative sign, uh, omega k become imaginary. This corresponds to an amplification of any fluctuation which would propagate along the sample, okay? And such amplification would lead to an emergence of self-order, okay? So uh, this uh, will be manifest if you measure intensity-intensity uh, correlations uh, at the detector. Then you will see that the intensity-intensity correlations have oscillations with this period uh, of KR uh, that I was talking about, the difference between the uh, laser wave vector and the grating wave vector. And this will be 
a strong signature of the non-locality of this interaction. Because if you have local interaction, you will only uh, have um, uh, this uh, intensity, intensity correlation if uh, Z and Z prime are the same. So this points out to uh, an, a possibility of mapping out everything we know about nonlinear optics, both quantum and classical, um, into this extremely non-local domain, which can be engineered in waveguide. So uh, the uh, summary is that there is a simple idea that has drastic consequences. The, the idea is to confine the dipoles in essentially one-dimensional uh, geometry, which can enhance dipolar uh, interactions. In transmission lines, okay, coaxial cables, this can lead to an enormous enhancement of uh, Casimir or Van der Waals forces, uh, whereas uh, in fibers, you can enhance dipole-dipole uh, 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 interaction by taking advantage of the cutoffs and band gaps that uh, exist in the presence of a grating that is embedded in such fibers. And this can give rise to either long-range uh, deterministic entanglement generation or to non-local, non-linear optics in the sense of a uh, uh, non-local, uh, uh, non-linear Schrodinger uh, wave equation with uh, an enormous wealth of implications, including thermodynamic implications that I have no time to discuss. Thank you very much for your...